I'm, uh, I'm not really the kind of guy who uh, typically buys candles, but when I was in the shop walking past this, it smelt like what I think the Home Alone house probably smelt like. So I had to buy it. Just uh, leave that there. Is that in there? Wonderful. Hello everybody and uh, welcome to what I think is probably about my 50th video that I've attempted to film outdoors and failed filming outdoors. <clears throat> I was out in the mountains yesterday, beautiful morning, got some nice photos, tried to go up a mountain, got about halfway up and then, uh, well, basically became a whiteout, bit of a blizzard, which wasn't ideal for sitting and talking in front of a camera, to be honest. So I decided to come back here and um, I'm afraid that means that there aren't mountains behind me that you can kind of look at when I get boring. It's quite overpowering. <sighs> put that back on later. Right, this is a video that I've put off making for a long time. I've wanted to make it for a long time, but there's been a big part of me that's thought, uh, it's quite obvious a lot of the stuff that you're gonna say, and therefore you just shouldn't bother. Now, about 18 months ago, I made a video about all the things that you shouldn't waste your money on when you're starting out in photography. And this is basically the opposite of that. It's the things that you should spend money on uh, when you're starting out in photography. Thing is, one of the things I'm gonna mention, for example, is a camera, which is incredibly obvious, but uh, I think there are enough talking points to justify uh, this video, and hopefully it'll be of interest to beginners. But yes, you will, you will need a camera. Now, in my defense, when it comes to uh, talking about needing a camera, I do have more to say than you need to buy a camera. Chiefly, I think when you're starting out in photography, the most important thing to look for when you're shopping for a camera is to make sure that it's an interchangeable lens camera. In fact, actually, it doesn't really even have to be an interchangeable lens camera. Uh, phones, for example, now have, in some cases, more than one lens. And point and shoots have got to a point now where they're pretty good across a range of different focal lengths and the sensors in them are really quite capable as well. So yeah, actually, it doesn't have to be an interchangeable lens camera like this one. It just needs to be capable of shooting at different focal lengths. Now again, I made a video uh, about a year ago, maybe just earlier this year. Again, I failed to film it outside, but that was all about how I think your second lens when you're starting out in photography should be one of these, which in the case of Micro Four Thirds is a 25 millimeter, but what most people will consider to be a nifty 50 is what you might have heard it called. Basically a 50 millimeter lens. This is 25 because the Micro Four Thirds to 35 mil conversion is half in focal length. That doesn't really matter for the time being, but basically it's a standard focal length prime. And I suggested that you could use one of these because the limitations created upon you when you use a prime lens that can't zoom, that forces you to get more creative. You have to zoom with your feet, you have to think an awful lot more about composition than you otherwise would do when you've got a zoom lens. I stand by that. I think this is an absolutely fantastic practice tool and I use this all the time. Even with just zoom lenses, I'll force myself to use one specific focal length to really hone in on my composition and really think much more about how I'm taking photos than I otherwise would if I was letting myself use all kinds of different focal lengths. So if it's a good idea to just use one focal length to really get to grips with your skills, why am I suggesting that you should get a camera that can achieve lots of different focal lengths? Uh, well, it comes down to boredom. When you start out in any hobby, it's crucial that you really, really enjoy the first 10, 12, 15 times that you do that hobby. You know, if you go fishing and for the first 20 times you go fishing, you don't get a single bite, I'd suggest if you're anything like me, chances are you won't go fishing anymore. And to be honest, I think it's the same with photography. You need to give yourself at the very start the best possible chance of getting some photos that you like, uh, of having some success, whatever you define success in photography as. And if you're just shooting with one focal length, there's a good chance that that limitation could mean that you get bored, you get frustrated, that you're not fulfilled by trying to get good photos because you're struggling to get good photos. And if that happens, you're probably just gonna put your camera away and never use it ever again. That is what we're trying to avoid when we're just starting out in photography. And having the option of using different focal lengths can help 
to get more photos and therefore more enjoyment from the process, which can in turn, what I'm looking for? I don't know what I'm looking for. I don't know why I started looking around then. Anyway, that can in turn mean that um, you're more likely to keep taking your camera out. Also, just learning how different focal lengths affect images is a huge part of learning photography. And finding out how something looks when it's framed at 24 millimeters versus when it's framed at 100 millimeters and comparing those two, that teaches you an awful lot about photos and how you can use focal lengths to impact your photos in future. And uh, so I would suggest that being able to shoot at those different focal lengths is a crucial skill to learn early on in your um, your photography journey. And whether that's with a phone with its different lenses and therefore focal lengths, or whether it's with a point and shoot and uh, it's, hang on, it's zoom options. Like so, I mean, you know what zooming looks like. Or whether it's with one of these, which uh, you can change the lenses on. And uh, it also has a viewfinder, which I think makes this package the most engaging of the three. Whatever it's with, I think you should have the option of uh, zooming, basically, is what I'd suggest you should look for in your first camera. I don't really care about megapixels when someone's picking out their first camera. I don't think you should care about things like dynamic range or sensor size. It's not important. That's not gonna improve your photos from the off. What's important is, I mean, I've, I've said it enough times now. You know what I'm trying to say. Lenses, yes. So chances are when you buy your interchangeable lens camera, it will come with a lens, which often is referred to as a kit lens. Now in times gone by, people often couldn't wait to upgrade their kit lenses because kit lenses were just a bit boring, not particularly good, not particularly sharp at all the focal length. And to some extent that will always be the case because kit lenses typically are made to a budget. However, cameras have got so good in the past five, 10 years that lenses have had to keep up with them because nobody's gonna sell a good camera with a really duff lens anymore. So for the most part, in my experience, kit lenses are actually pretty good and they represent really good value. Also, they're incredibly versatile so this one, for example, zooms from 12 millimeters or 24 millimeters if you've got a full frame camera to 60 millimeters or 120 millimeter full frame equivalent. And that is a really good focal range to, um, to be practicing with. Now, like I said in the video that I was referencing earlier, the 25 or a 50, a nifty 50, or just a, a standard focal length prime is an ideal second lens to get because it gives you a point of difference. A, it forces you, as I said, to uh, use one single focal length at the time that you're using this lens. B, it'll probably be quite a bit sharper than your kit lens. C, it'll be fantastic in low light because it opens up much more than your kit lens. And D, because it's probably got a wider aperture, you can uh, throw subjects in and out of focus much more and you can get bokeh. <laughs> which uh, is a word used to describe the soft, out of focus, lovely, creamy, um, basically the nice blur that you can get when things in your frame are out of focus. Now the downside of getting a lens like this as your second lens is that the chances are the focal length is probably already covered in your kit lens. And therefore the main point that I've tried to raise with a lens like this, that you're basically constrained to a particular focal length and that's good for creativity, is mute to some extent because you can achieve exactly the same thing with this by just saying to yourself, well, I'm just gonna keep the lens at one particular focal length and I'm not going to move it. You don't actually need to have to physically constrain yourself with uh, a prime to be able to do that. You just need to be disciplined with a zoom lens. And so it comes down to personal preference really as to what should be your second lens. There are arguments that suggest a prime is a good way to go. I could also make a strong argument to suggest that you should get a telephoto lens as well. Primarily, as you might expect, because it'll increase the focal lengths that you can operate at uh, compared with just your kit lens. That won't necessarily be as good in the dark as a prime lens, for example, but it will give you more opportunities to experiment with uh, compositions, different compositions, and therefore it'll increase your chances of potentially getting good photos or more photos, which will increase your chances of continually going out with your camera, which ultimately, as I mentioned before, is the aim of the game at the point where you're just starting out in photography. So yeah, that's lenses. After your kit lens, I'd suggest you either 
look out for a prime, a standard focal length prime, or a telephoto lens. You don't have to spend the earth, you don't have to get the most expensive version of a fixed focal length prime, and you definitely don't have to get the most expensive version of a telephoto lens. There's typically a whole range of lenses to choose from, regardless of the system that you've bought into, and uh, yeah, I'd suggest not spending the earth uh, with either of these options. Photography bags are hugely expensive, typically really expensive. And I would suggest that when you just start out in photography, it's probably a bit excessive to get a bag specifically just for your camera gear, particularly if you've not really got all that much camera gear yet. However, as I alluded to before, the aim of the game with photography when you just start out, like any hobby, is making sure you do it continually, making sure you want to go out the next time and the time after that and the time after that. And a bag or storage or access to your gear is crucial to that process. So if you get into a habit of taking out whatever bag you use, typically a messenger bag, a backpack, whatever it might be, and you just stuff your camera at the bottom of that bag, then I would suggest there will be times when you're walking past something that you might think constitutes a decent photo and you might think, oh, I'm not gonna get my camera out of my bag. I can't be bothered getting it out the bottom. That means taking it off my shoulders, that means digging to the bottom past my coat, past my lunch, past my water bottle, whatever it might be. That is exactly what we're trying to avoid. So I would suggest that either you get a really cheap camera bag, and uh, I've made a video about cheap versus expensive camera bags. I'll put it here, you're here, I can't remember which side it is. Or you should get something like this, which is like a little insert that you can put within a bag that just stores your camera gear. So you can stick this at the top of your, uh, your rucksack and you can take all your camera gear out all in one go if you need to get stuff under it, or you can just make sure that your camera gear is super accessible when you don't. And within here, you can stick dividers, so you can put like a lens in that bit, you can put your camera body in that bit. It just makes your stuff easier to get at, which hopefully will mean you're more likely to take photos, and that will mean that you're more likely to go out and improve your photography and get further and further nestled into the, the hobby. Nestled, invested, emotionally invested. It's probably a whole load of words I could have used then. Would have made more sense than this. Doesn't matter. On a similar sort of note, and in line with uh, trying to cut the resistance between you and getting to your photography gear, I'd suggest you have a system in place that enables you to carry your photography gear outside of your camera bag. Namely, either a really good strap, which I definitely think is money well spent. Typically the straps that come with cameras are rubbish, they're not comfortable, they don't stretch far enough, and uh, they're just not very good. So yeah, I'd suggest a padded strap that's easily removable. This one is from Peak Design, and I think is very good. It's made out of basically what is, I mean, seat belt material, really. That's the only other place I've come across a strap like this. Very comfortable, very easily adjustable, and uh, it's red, this one, so quite pretty. So yeah, straps are a good way to go, or you can get hold of something like this, which is a clip or a Peak Design Capture, this particular one is called. And it goes on your rucksack strap or a messenger bag strap, and basically your camera just clips into it. I've made a video about these as well that I'll put up here somewhere, compared a cheap one to this Peak Design one. And like I said, the aim of the game with these is just to cut resistance, to make sure that you can take as many photos or give yourself the opportunity for as many photos as possible, which in turn should mean you give yourself the opportunity of uh, good photos more than you otherwise would. And that should hopefully mean that you end up going out with your camera a lot more. Time for some more. <clears throat> Can you get addicted to candles? I don't know, but. The last thing that I'd say you need as a beginner photographer is something that you actually don't need to spend any money on thankfully, which is always good when you start a hobby. Hobbies are typically expensive and uh, you don't want to spend loads and loads and loads of cash. Continue where well, you do, but it hurts to do it. It's always fun looking at new gear, but yeah, a bit painful on the wallet. Anyway, I'm talking about a goal, which sounds like a bit of a strange thing to say, but most hobbies, when you start them, have some kind of objective. For example, if you start playing golf, golf has a scoring system. If you go fishing, like I was talking about before, you probably end up counting the number of fish you get. It's quite an easy way to measure how good a day you've had in some respects. Uh, if you take up running, you'll probably time yourself. If you start playing guitar, you'll have an appreciation of how many chords you know. But in photography, 
your success is harder to measure yourself. And typically what people end up doing is trying to work out how good a photographer they are by things like social media likes and stuff, which is an awful way to judge how your hobby is going. Now, a common goal that you'll probably hear a lot that lots of photographers aim for, me included, is to try and get one good photo every time I go out with my camera. And when I say good, that's good in your eyes only. It doesn't have to be good based on anyone else's opinion. It just has to be your opinion. That said, I think there's a better goal, uh, a slightly better goal that requires slightly deeper analysis. And that is trying to get parts of a photo that you really like and trying to increase the number of those parts of photos that you like over time. For example, I might go out with my camera uh, this afternoon and I might get five photos that I think are sort of half decent. But I might look at each of those photos and identify three things that I like about each of them. And an example of that might be the sky in one of them. Uh, it might be a car in another. It might be the way the light plays with a tree in another. It might be the fog in another. It might be how I've composed some water in another one. It might be how I've played with exposure in another one. You get the idea, just elements of a photo that you like that you can take forward into other photos. So I might end up with 15 from my uh, haul of photos this afternoon, 15 parts of photos overall that I like from my five photos. Five times three, that is 15, isn't it? So then the next time I go out of my camera, the goal is just to beat 15 parts of photos that I like. It's not a perfect system, and you can cheat it easily yourself by saying, oh, yeah, I quite like that as well. And then you just beat your previous score. And it's not always gonna be uniform. Typically, photography as an improvement process looks a little bit like this. It's not a straight line up, it's kind of up and down, up and down, particularly with outdoor photography, because the conditions are always changing, and the conditions, are a huge part of what makes good photos. But I find as a tool for improving, that kind of analysis much more useful than just working out whether you like an entire photo or not. Because if you spend time looking at a photo and you like how you've exposed a certain scene or you like the sky in the scene, you can learn from each individual element of that and take that forward into other photography trips and days out. And that hopefully should improve your photos and hopefully mean that you continually go out with your camera. Much more so, I think, than just working out whether you like a whole photo or not. Uh, yeah, so that is five things that I think you need as a, a beginner photographer. I need to blow this out again. <laughs> Last time today, no more. Uh, right, thank you very much for watching and thank you also to today's video sponsor, Skillshare. So Skillshare is an amazing online learning platform full of thousands of courses in all kinds of different creative pursuits, including photography. So there are loads of different classes all about photography on Skillshare and you can learn all about composition, color, editing, all that kind of stuff, as well as lots of other creative endeavors. This month, I've been brushing up on my copywriting skills by taking a couple of copywriting classes, which I did quite often in uh, my previous life as a, a marketer. When I worked in marketing, I did quite a bit of copywriting. And uh, I've been starting to think about next year's book, which is probably gonna include some copy. So I've quite enjoyed getting to grips with uh, words again, rather than just trying to make pretty pictures in my life. <clears throat> So that's what I've been up to. Uh, so yeah, if you're just starting out in any creative hobby, including photography, I'd really recommend checking Skillshare out. And the first thousand of my subscribers to click the link in my description will get a free trial to Skillshare Premium. And after that, if you decide to carry on, you'll pay less than $10 a month to access to all the classes that Skillshare has to offer. So yeah, a huge thank you to Skillshare. I'd really recommend checking them out, particularly if you're in the early days of your photography journey. And uh, thank you for watching. A big thank you for watching. And I'll see you next time when hopefully, and I've said this so many times before, I'll be outdoors because I really don't like making videos indoors. I'm an outdoors photographer, it just doesn't really feel right. It is much easier though than, than trying to talk to a camera when there are 50 mile an hour winds and there's just snow pelting you in the face. <clears throat> I can't take my candle out on days like that, so. See you next time.